Good morning, everybody. I'm Mans Choi from Seoul National University, Korea. Um, I'm chairing today's plenary session together with my co-chair, Professor Jose Castillo from UNED, Spain. I'm very pleased and honored to introduce today's speaker, Professor Gerhard Kasper. As we all know, Professor uh, Gerhard Kasper has been playing a leading role to our aerosol community, not only in deepening our understanding of fund fundamentals of aerosol, but also in promoting our field significantly. He served as an editor-in-chief of General Aerosol Science for more than 20 years, and his research on filtrations and more recently on functional nanoparticles published many pioneering papers. This morning, he's going to present his recent work related to the structuring and characterizing multi-scale functional nanomaterials. Please join me in welcoming Professor Gerhard Kasper. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much, Mansu, and uh, I owe a special thanks, of course, to Roberta. I was really flattered by your invitation to talk about aerosol technology. And this is the title I gave her more or less spontaneously when she asked me a long time ago what I would like to talk about. In the meantime, I almost regret this a little bit because um, I didn't really want to highlight materials that much. Um, my objective is to talk about aerosol technology. And so um, the way out was to highlight a little bit in colors the words aerosol technology. And um, this was going to be my first slide with which to start the presentation. And I'm sure you have all seen those kinds of very colorful, impressive slides. And you all know that um, particles are the building blocks uh, of many modern functional materials all the way to devices. Um, but again, this is not a materials conference. This is not a conference about solar cells and uh, making drugs and drug delivery. It's an aerosol conference. And also, I would, rather than wishing to impress you with all kinds of things that we have made in terms of particles, I would like to prefer to inspire you uh, to get some new ideas. So what is aerosol technology? I mean, what is it good for? Most people, um, probably spontaneously, and maybe even in this audience also, many people spontaneously would think about measurement techniques. Aerosol technology, or aerosol science, of course, behind that, I'm including that in the word aerosol technology, has been really good at developing in situ real-time measurement techniques to characterize aerosols and particles. No question. But there's a lot more to it. <clears throat> Filtration and separation are age-old technologies which are attached to aerosols. Combustion is another huge field in which aerosols and aerosol technology play an important role fundamentally and in the applied sense. There's electrosprays, and I'm sure in this audience you can think of a lot more things. But then in the end, of course, also, um, is, it is about designing processes. And again, it's not about the materials as such. It's about designing the processes to uh, synthesize particles, to structure particles, to coat, to, to layer, to, to build micro devices, if you will. So all of this is, uh, and not a complete list, but this, all of this is aerosol technology. <coughs> And, um, well, since I have materials in the title, let's start talking about processes, examples of aerosol-based process sequences for particle structuring. Um, I have three example areas that I want to talk about. One of them is chemical vapor deposition on aerosol particles. This is something that can be used, for example, to design catalysts, and that's where we have used it 
for quite a while, and so that's where I have examples. Um, another one, an antidote, if you will, to the chemical vapor deposition would be a physical coating process of particle surfaces via electrostatics. And then uh, I wanted to also briefly touch on photochemistry uh, as a non-invasive uh, technique to work on particles and on the surfaces of particles. And I'm going to say a few words about encapsulation coding in combination with other tricks, let's say, from the toolbox of aerosols. In between, uh, I'm going to show you examples because in the end, if you want to design a process, if you want to tailor particles with very specific properties, you have to be able to measure at every step. You have to characterize the process, what's going on with the particles. You have to resolve the kinetics. And as you know, most aerosol processes are continuous processes. They are not processes which run to equilibrium. That's one of the big differences to processing in liquids, where you usually have an equilibrium process, and when you're finished, then you filter your particles, and then you can do other things. In aerosol technology, the processes are almost always driven by competing kinetics. So measurements is a must. And then, uh, at the end of the talk, I'm going to slide over to another really interesting field where I think aerosol technology has a lot to contribute. Uh, and this is structure-functional relationships. In the end, I mean, you're making, everybody who makes particles today speaks about functional particles and functional materials. But if you want to put some meaning into this and not just use it as an empty shell, then you actually have to also be able to characterize these functions. And the objective is not to characterize the function only in the final material, because then you've lost a lot of the connection between the original particle properties, which you have just been designing into them during the process of making them, um, because you have a lot of intermediate steps. So again, if you could resolve this, uh, it would be interesting. And so there are some thoughts that I have there. Let's start um, with a typical process flow diagram for synthesizing and structuring. And you have three blocks here. Uh, you have a first block, which is about the primary synthesis. You have to make particles. And I'm assuming now, this is an assumption, it doesn't have to be like that, but I'm assuming that you're synthesizing from a gas to particle conversion process. You don't have to. You can also use previously fabricated particles, if you will. But in the beginning, you impart a primary structure on the particles. You give them some fractal or a more compact or maybe completely fused shape. But then, uh, to make functional materials, you continue with structuring processes. I'm just using this as a general word for everything. Uh, you structure the surface. You work on the surface texture. You work on physical and chemical functionalization of the particle surfaces. And there are kinds of, these are just cartoons here. Functionalization can mean imparting electrical charge on the particles to do something in the next step. It certainly means controlling surface functional groups and putting the ones on the surface that you want. And of course, you can also place material in the form of continuous or discontinuous layers on the surfaces, or you can uh, encapsulate materials into the particles. And all of this um, is an integrated, and I'm looking at this as an, as an integrated gas phase process uh, for making these particles. But you're not finished when you've made the particles because nobody wants to just have a powder, if you will. Uh, if, um, there's a ve relatively little value added in most cases to just making a powder and collecting it with a filter. Um, this is the, in the early stages of material science, this is all you have to do is just collect particles. In most cases, the uh, material, quote unquote, the material really that you want uh, has to, uh, needs another scale of structuring. Uh, so what I'm calling this is mesoscale structuring here, if you will, um, which can mean layering. Aerosol technology has a lot to offer in terms of layer formation. There are lots of tricks there. Um, you can also um, wish to make the transition into the liquid phase. This is done in an extremely primitive fashion in most cases today. Uh, most cases you take a powder and stir it into the liquid, if you will. Or, uh, but there are direct transfer processes, of course, out of the aerosol phase. And controlling such things as surface tension and avoiding you know, agglomeration in the transfer, there's a lot of 
there's a lot of room here for process improvement. And then, of course, you continue with uh, structuring processes in the liquid phase. And while I was thinking about this a few days ago about what to say, I realized that I should have actually put a third block here, which I didn't. You can also take these particles coming out of the aerosol process and begin directly structuring devices. This is what Mansu does. Mm -hmm. He makes tiny microscopic devices with rough, sophisticated electrostatic lenses, and actually he's directly depositing the particles from the process into this system. The huge advantage of this, you pay a price for this, of course, because as I said, this process is continuous, and the continuous process requires a huge amount of control over the kinetics. You always have competing kinetics, and you want not some kinetic to dominate, but the one that really gives you the structure that you wish to have. But the advantage, of course, is such things as purity. You have perfectly controlled surfaces of the particles to the very last minute. And I will actually show you an example in the CVD where this is really welcome. Well, and in the whole uh, process, of course, of making this, you want to have um, preferably online tools uh, for structural analysis. And I've highlighted a few that I will talk about uh, during the course of this uh, presentation. Uh, all of you know, of course, that one can do size and fractality and electrical charge. This is nothing terribly new and exciting anymore, but there are a lot of other things you can do with aerosol techniques. So, an integrated process by chemical vapor synthesis and atmospheric pressure CVD to make catalyst particles. This is uh, a little bit the mirror of what I have just shown you as a flow diagram. In the first step on the left block here, you make the primary particles, and then you go into a chemical vapor deposition process. Um, as always, when you make particles out of the gas phase, or almost always, um, not always, because there are some people who are avoiding, of course, the precursors, but um, actually you work out of a precursor, which is an organometallic uh, compound, which you decompose, uh, and then you have a, a classical gas to particle conversion process, you usually make highly fractal particles, and then you can continue to process them. Now, when you, uh, I'm not going to go into a great, deal of, a great deal of detail about this first process step, because this is relatively well established. I mean, this is, I would say, today's aerosol technology knows how to handle this kind of process, and when you have fractal particles, uh, you also know how to restructure them. There's what's called thermal restructuring, which works very well by applying uh, a certain amount of heat. You can rearrange and you can grow the primary particles. This is a wonderful tool for modifying the primary particles with temperature here. And if you go high enough, then of course you fuse all these highly fractal agglomerates to spheres. This is something that's controlled. I mean, many people have worked on the sintering process. And so I don't need to say much about it, except again to highlight that here you're also often playing on competing kinetics, because if you look at the restructuring as a function of temperature, uh, this is, uh, I think, Alfred Weber who originally developed this graph here, you can see that for a particular material here, I think this is titania here, uh, you first in the lower temperature range grow your primary particle size, and you can see this, the primary particles grow, and only beyond 500 degrees are you then really also beginning to restructure. And this is different for every material. Here comes my first intercalation slide for a measurement technique, uh, uh, impact fragmentation of nanoagglomerates. When you have a very fractal agglomerate, um, then the question very often arises as to the interparticle forces. Is this a material which can be redispersed very easily? Is it something that potentially breaks, breaks up when it enters into the lung fluids? Or will it stay a rigid agglomerate? And one can do this, uh, for example, by impacting particles in the surface in a, in a, a low-pressure impactor with a very defined velocity. And you can then look, and this is what you see here on the right side, you can look at um, defragmentation curves. This is the defragmentation probability versus impact velocity versus impact kinetics. And then you can draw conclusions about the degree of, let's say, breakup that you can achieve as a function of the prior processing temperature. So now you have, um, and in our case, we really like to work with spheres because spheres, so we fuse the carrier particles of our catalysts to spheres very quickly. 
because this permits us to have a better vision of, of what's going on on the surface. And now you move into this chemical vapor deposition process. This is the CVD of the active phase, as we say in catalysis. And um, what you do, chemical vapor deposition, is essentially the same concept as chemical vapor synthesis. You start out with a precursor, an organometallic precursor, which is easily vaporized at very low temperatures. And then you would like this precursor to uh, deposit, and it's usually a metal or an oxide, onto the surface of the particle. So it can be a continuous layer, or it can be a discontinuous layer, which you would like to control. Um, the huge difference between CVD and CVS is that in chemical vapor synthesis, you initiate via a chemical supersaturation, a gigantic supersaturation, and you have homogeneous nucleation instantly at the limit, practically, of you have supersaturations of thousands. In chemical vapor deposition, you do not exactly not want that. You would like to have a decomposition of this precursor only on the surface. And the question is really how you control it. And this is where aerosol technology also can play a role in studying these processes. Because I'm showing this as an example here uh, for an organic metallic material here, which is cyclopentadienyl allyl palladium. So palladium is the metal with some organic groups attached to it. And what you would like is you would like this precursor to decompose only on the surface. You need to um, impart certain properties on your precursors to get that to happen. Uh, it has to, of course, be volatile. It has to uh, be thermally stable so it doesn't decompose too quickly. It has to get all the way to the surface. And uh, you also would like sometimes even, and this is where modern, we work together with organic chemists in this area, we would also like to have sometimes even bimetallic precursors who co-deposit two different materials because this is interesting, especially also for um, catalyst design. Now, there is something uh, that you can use, some tricks to control this CVD, and that is that in the particular case of this precursor, you actually attach the precursor to an OH group. You have a proton donor reaction, and essentially uh, the hydrogen disappears and the palladium attaches here onto the silica terminated uh, surface and the organic groups, they just disappear and you don't have them in the process anymore. You can uh, therefore control the CVD via the OH groups in this particular case on the surface and with a whole family of precursors. Uh, you can turn this on and off. If you remove all the OH groups, then you have practically no coding. If you turn the OH groups on, you have it and you can do switch back and forth and mind you, this is an online measurement. I'll say a few words about it in a minute. And the resolution here is a fraction of a nanometer. Okay, so you can really see what you're doing in your process. So here is your process flow again. And the point is, in order to have a defined number of OH groups on these carrier particles, at this stage, you have to work in the primary particle synthesis process to already include this thought into the process. And there are ways. I won't get too much into the details for lack of time. You can start by controlling such things as water and oxygen content in this process. You can control the formation rate of OH groups. And the beauty about this is that the CVD process, therefore, and this is very different from the classical nucleation processes, in the classical nucleation process, when you increase the concentration of your precursor, you have bigger particles and you have more. In the CVD, you, the OH groups control the number of dots on the surface of these nanodots, and the precursor concentration controls the size. And therefore, you have, first of all, you can vary greatly the dot density. You can see you can vary the dot density by almost two orders of magnitude from a quasi-continuously coated surface to a very sparsely coated one, and the dot diameter doesn't change much in the process with um, coding parameters, let's say. You can also get extremely, for aerosol standards, extremely monodisperse systems, and if you look closely here, these are all log-normal distributions, and the interesting thing is that as the nanodots get bigger, the geometric standard deviation decreases. So there is, uh, I don't know whether he's here, uh, 
showed, I think it was with Akhtar, they wrote a very nice paper some years ago showing that if you have uniform coding of particles, you always narrow the size distribution. And exactly this is what's happening. You're going from 1.2 to 1.1. So this is another proof also of the fact that the CVD is a surface reaction. It's an autocatalytic reaction. Now, what makes the difference between a continuously spreading layer of some inorganic material and a discrete layer of an inorganic material? Well, it's the surface wettability. It is the uh, surface energy, the interaction energy between the coating material and the sublayer. And um, in fact, you can see this very nicely if you, uh, and oxides and metals have different degrees of wettability. So if you have metallic surfaces on an oxide, you very often have uh, a discontinuous layer. If you have oxidic layers, you have continuous layers. And this is an example where by continuous reduction, you're actually breaking up the layer and all of a sudden, this layer breaks up into individual little droplets, solid droplets, if you will, uh, because you're changing the wettability. This interaction energy has a lot to do also uh, with material pairing. You can, um, if you use different substrate particles, then you get different degrees of stability also of these nanodots, which is very important for catalysis. And last but not least, there is also an argument for making these primary particles in direct synthesis. Because um, if you, you, of course, you could also use commercial carrier particles. And in catalyst design, the commercial carrier particles are often much cheaper than the ones that you make via uh, vapor synthesis. But um, unless you really have a control over their surface, uh, you don't get the results that you wish. And this is just an example here of an as receive. This is commercial silica, and you can see that this oxide layer, this is a molybdenum oxide in this particular case, uh, it doesn't spread properly. Uh, whereas uh, if you calcinate the surface and if you remove, that's why I inserted these graphs in the right set, in the as received particles, you have a lot of hydrocarbon contamination, organic uh, stuff, if you will, on the surface. And this is what prevents um, the um, material from spreading. We don't really understand what drives this very well. This is practically, I would say, anecdotal. This is just some information. But it also opens the door um, to other surface structuring processes because if you could combine a defined, uh, let us say, uh, chemical distribution of uh, surface functional groups which do not permit this local spreading, then you could create islands and other things. So there's a room here also for interesting structuring possibilities. Um, Surface functional groups play a very important role um, in uh, chemical vapor deposition on particles on flat surfaces too. On a, uh, atomic layer deposition is a well-known technique. It's a vacuum technique. Our technique is an atmospheric pressure technique. That's the huge advantage. I didn't say this in the beginning. If you CV, CVD is a very well-known process, but it typically happens under vacuum conditions in the plasma, which is a process which is very difficult to handle for particles. In the case uh, of an aerosol, you would really like, to, ideally, you would like to have ambient uh, pressure because at ambient pressure, you can also apply all your aerosol measurement techniques. If you're operating in, at, at 10 millibar, you cannot use a DMA afterwards to see what your particles look like, for example. So we have been thinking about how to measure surface um, functional groups. It's not that simple. Of course, you can do offline FTIR, and that's what we've been doing most of the time. Uh, together with Martin Seitenbusch, we also tried to use an optical particle counter and see whether we could use single particle fluorescence from that particle counter to identify the concentration, but this requires um, tricks which are not that simple to handle. There is room here also from the community, I think, who are making UVAPs and things like that to work uh, not so much on the bioaerosols, because this is what UVAPS was made for, of course, but to work also potentially on looking at uh, surface functional groups. And, of course, there are also elegant titration techniques. I'm thinking of um, uh, uh, Urs. I think you, you were one of the initiators of this. You can titrate uh, with great sensitivity. You have a sub monolayer sensitivity also for surface functional groups, but it's all sort of halfway offline at the moment. So there's something that we need to work on. And continuing along the line of measurement techniques, how do you measure 
this equivalent coating thickness with such high resolution. If you look at this graph on the right side here, and this is palladium on silica, you can see that as a function of your coating temperature in the palladium, in, in other words, the amount of material that you're putting into the system, you can have equivalent layer thicknesses which range from a tenth of a nanometer up to several nanometers. So you can have a continuous coating or just a very sparse discrete coating. You do this by a tandem technique um, uh, and where you uh, combine a mobility spectrometer and uh, a variable uh, cut point um, single stage low pressure impactor and by measuring twice at the same mobility diameter uh, you get a shift via the density because as soon as you're putting palladium onto silica that you don't add a layer really because the layer is less than a nanometer but you change the average density of the particle and aerodynamically you see that change in average density and that's what you detect with great sensitivity. The sensitivity increases um, dramatically uh, with the shell. It's not held to core. There's an S that disappeared here. It's shell to core. Um, uh, so if you go to relatively large density ratios, then you have indeed sub nanometer resolution. And by the way, uh, if you compare this with electron microscopy, it works beautifully. The agreement is excellent. Um, Moreover, with the impacted technique, or the, let's say the tandem technique, you can also see layers when you do not see them in the electron microscope, because the electron microscope is predicated on a, high com on a contrast between the layer and the core. If the materials have a similar uh, um, position in the uh, periodic system, then you don't see much when the mass numbers are not too different, and then you have trouble resolving. Uh, you can do multi-shell structures, and indeed you can also see, and this is uh, from um, Frederick Weiss's recent work also, you can beautifully see that as the process, uh, the temperature, the, let's say the, the, the amount of precursor increases, there is suddenly a decrease in the layer thickness. And this is the moment when you have homogeneous nucleation in your process, because now you're converting the precursor not to coating additional, but you're actually making particles in addition. You can also see this from the picture here. So such an online technique is a wonderful way of looking into the process and seeing right away if you are, let's say, this is a way of, of optimizing your process parameters. Um, I said I wanted to talk about particle structure versus particle function. What you use there uh, in aerosol technology is you use the advantage of very precise tailoring of the particle structures. And this allows you to measure uh, the functionality much better than if you, for example, use conventional processes in catalysis. You have, but what you also need is you, have, you need ways of measuring functionality. And ideally, you would like to do this in real time or in quasi-real time. And again, I want to use some examples from catalytically active engineered nanoparticles. Uh, due to lack of time, I can really only concentrate on a cartoon here. But this, these two pictures are quite instructive. Um, the catalytic activity expressed in turnover frequency, the number of product molecules per surface molecule of the catalyst, if you do that, and you can see that, and this is quite well known, these are the so-called volcano curves uh, in catalysis. The uh, catalytic activity is an extremely sensitive function, usually, of the primary particle diameter in the range of, let's say, 1 to 5, 10, 15, 20 nanometers. It depends on the type of catalytic reaction you're looking at. And what aerosol technology now does is, you see, I'm not only just making material to sell material to somebody, I have a laboratory tool to design particles with such a precision that I can actually resolve these kinds of curves, which with conventional techniques, if you look into the catalyst literature, you often have disputes about what kind of sensitivity, structural sensitivity you have, because these people lack the precision of tailoring the size. And aerosol technology gives you tools at hand here. Um, there's more to it than that, of course, because what I'm showing you here uh, is to some extent, at least, these measurements here are offline measurements. These measurements here were online measurements here, um, actually in an aerosol process, a catalytic reaction in a flow reactor. 
but you can also use other techniques which are often overlooked to study um, functional um, properties of particle surface, and this is aerosol photoelectron emission energy spectroscopy. You ionize the particles. The technique um, was developed uh, in the late 80s by Siegmund and his group in Switzerland, and you can see some prominent names here in the room. Uh, Andreas Schmidt-Ort, Heinz Burcher, those were the people who came up with this tool. It was shown that you could use this for probing surfaces. Uh, what do you do? You illuminate the particles with a, a, UV, a light, usually a short wavelength light of a specific wavelength, and then you look at the charging probability of the particles. And uh, beyond a certain threshold, uh, you get that that's where your uh, work function is, that's where you get electron emission, and then you also use the slope uh, of the uh, yield curve afterwards because the slope is, if, if you have a steep slope, this means you have many electrons available in the Fermi C below in, in, the, in the valence or in the band of the, of the particle, and that means you have many electron, electrons who are, which are mobile and available. And this is really interesting in catalysis, and I'm going to skip this here. Um, you have to remember catalytically active materials are those which have a lot of active electrons which can contribute to um, chemical changes on the surface of absorbed species. And this is where this APES shows some really interesting uh, correlations. In this particular case here, APES was used to probe the poisoning of a particle surface. Uh, and the reaction that you have here is your methanation of CO, CO gets absorbed, um, and as it gets absorbed, it's split into carbon uh, and oxygen, and the carbon uh, stays behind to some extent. It doesn't all react with the hydrogen to CH4 and leave, but it stays behind, and the result is that you're beginning to gradually coat uh, your, it's what's called coking in, in, in catalysis technology, you begin to coat the particle surface, and as you're coding it, you can see that a fraction of a carbon monolayer is already sufficient um, to um, destroy your photoelectric activity. In other words, the carbon doesn't emit electrons anymore. And there's a very beautiful co correlation here with, with catalytic activity. So I think that uh, APS is a way of probing catalytic processes also in the aerosol phase. Okay, um, time is moving and I need to move on also to uh, a second example, physical coding. Physical coding of particle surfaces via a selective electrostatic agglomeration. The idea is not new. I'm using, using this also again to highlight the possibilities of aerosol technology. Um, what do you do? Uh, first of all, I should say that this is interesting because it's a physical alternative to um, the chemical vapor deposition. Chemical vapor deposition requires carefully tuned material systems in terms of age groups and the chemistry of the precursor and other things. Physical coating uh, doesn't really care about the chemistry of the particles which you use for coating or for the particles in the substrate. What you do is you have two aerosol streams. You have one which are your functional particles, the coatings, and then you have your carrier particles. You charge them oppositely and you mix them. And when you have oppositely charged aerosol streams, obviously you drive a selective um, coding. The idea as such is not new. It has been used for binary systems. But if you impart a very large charge on the carrier particles, and the nanoparticles typically have at best one charge, then you have a multiple coding of your surface, very much in the same style as I showed you with CVD here. This is, again, palladium and silica. It's the same material system. The beauty of this is that the kinetics are very fast. They are uh, an order of magnitude or more than faster than the thermal diffusion. Um, so you have a process that runs to completion in like a minute or less. Uh, the issue, of course, is charging efficiency. This is something that you need to work on. And what one is interested in is, of course, you have a, a, a kinetic model. How to verify this kinetic model? You can see that the... Um, uh, Coding process runs to completion very quickly. And Steffi uh, Sigmund, who did this work, uh, came up with a very ingenious way of looking at the kinetics. And this is a classical aerosol technology approach. She measured the charge of the carrier particles. The carrier particles here begin with 
something like 40 unit charges, charge units per carrier particle, and within a relatively short period of time, this charge gets neutralized. And the neutralization of this charge is essentially a measure for the kinetics of the coding. Okay, so you have a real-time technique for looking at your coding process. Um, the third example I want to talk about is photochemistry. Photochemistry can be used, A, to modify surface functional groups um, in conjunction with other gaseous species. We're talking about aerosols here. There's, of course, also photochemistry in the liquid phase, but we're in the aerosol phase here. Um, you can modify surface functional groups, and you can use it for photopolymerization. Uh, and here um, you can, again, play with the toolbox of um, aerosol science. Let me first of all show you photopolymerization, because this is an underrated um, technique also. What you do is you generate a monomer droplet, a monomer droplet possibly with an initiator in there to speed up the polymerization. Then you put some UV on this from an eczema lamp, for example. And within less than a minute, half a minute or a minute, you have a polymer particle, a small polymer particle. You can also use this uh, to um, produce spray droplets with um, solid particles in the drop, a, a filler, a monomer, and nanoparticles, and then you have filled or partially filled particles. Um, this is a way of designing um, particles, and uh, I'm going to skip this. I just want, I had this in here only to show that the kinetics of polymerization are very fast. This has caused a bit of a stir in the community uh, of the polymer people because they didn't think it could be done so quickly. But you can also use this to make small, very thin coatings, uh, organic coatings. You can encapsulate particles with organic coatings. What you do is you produce monomer droplets and you produce the particle which you want to coat, both in an aerosol stream. You impart relatively equal opposite charges and you mix them and then you have a selective binary coagulation. Uh, as you do that, the uh, monomer begins to spread around the carrier particle. This goes with a certain kinetic which you can enhance if the monomer is too viscous by raising a little bit the temperature, and then you put your VUV on there. And if you know how to tune the ratio of the size of the carrier particle and the drop, you can actually design a certain layer thickness. And this is, again, a very fast process. And last but not least, uh, photochemistry can also be used to modify the Van der Waals bonds. This is some work which goes back quite a number of years and unfortunately didn't get carried on too far because my colleague Andre Braun left uh, Karlsruhe. Uh, he was responsible for much of the photochemistry. We were responsible for the aerosol technology. Uh, what you see here are fragmentation curves. Again, this is the same fragmentation process, impact fragmentation process that uh, we used fragmentation technique that we used before for the silica particles. And here you can see that the uh, fragmentation curves shifts to higher or lower energies depending on what kind of surface functional groups you put on there. And this, in this case, I believe these were carbonyl groups and OH groups. And this is, of course, known that if you have surfaces which have a large number of hydroxyl groups, hydroxyl groups tend to increase the Van der Waals bonds, but there are other systems which apparently do the opposite. So there's some room. This is something you can only do with organic particles. Okay, I want to continue, and this is now the last part of um, my talk. Uh, I want to continue along the line of functionality. I want to change a little bit the subject. I want to move on to functionality-based exposure assessment. Exposure assessment to engineered nanoparticles is a big issue. Uh, and the first problem, uh, typically in the workplace, in workplace air, is to identify the nanoparticles against the background. Because uh, depending on what kind of background aerosol you have, 
the nanoparticles more or less, the, the size distribution of the nanoparticle disappears in that background unless you have an extremely potent source, of course. Moreover, if you have nanoparticles, um, uh, if you produce nanoparticles in a background aerosol, the attachment kinetics uh, between the nanoparticles and the uh, background particles is very fast. If you have a diameter ratio of, let's say, 10, which is nothing unusual, the background particles are a few tenths of a micrometer and the nanoparticles are a few hundredths of a nanometer, then the attachment kinetics is exponential. So within a relatively short period of time, certainly less than an hour, all these nanoparticles are gone. And the problem is, how do you know you have nanoparticles there? So the idea that we had was, well, we need something like a substance-specific detection. And since we were doing catalysis all along, we said, well, let's do something like a sort of a quasi-real-time catalysis. The system is conceptually very simple. You sample a very tiny amount, a few micrograms of aerosol on a filter, and then you ini immediately initiate a chemical reaction on that filter. You can sample, the, the time you sample depends on the concentration. In the lab, you can do this in a few minutes, and the chemical reaction takes, uh, to record with an FDR, it takes a few minutes, and you have an answer about the concentration. This is what this machine looks like. It's quite portable. This was part of an EU project, and portability was a big issue there. And you use a non-dispersive infrared sensor, so it's much smaller than an FDIR. It makes a relatively fast device, and in fact, it's very sensitive. You see, the palladium is the most active uh, of all the catalysts, pretty much, so you need nanograms of palladium as a lower detection limit, and for most other things, you need micrograms. And interestingly, mm -hmm. this, as the sensitivity decreases, so also does the threat of the nanoparticles because, of course, as you're going down in this list, iron oxide is a much less potent catalyst than platinum or palladium. Um, as we were doing this work, we realized that we had a problem. And the problem is exactly this graph, which I had already shown you before. Uh, the catalytic activity of a material is not proportional to its mass because it's highly sensitive to the primary particles diameter. Uh, in fact, there isn't any metric uh, that will properly describe the catalytic effect. And uh, so, and by the way, and I'm going to get to this in a minute, this is also true for biological effects. Biological effects are also size dependent. And I don't mean size dependent that they're surface area dependent. I mean after you've normalized your signal for surface area. And this signal here, the turnover frequency is per surface area already. So the surface area is already out of this calculation. So I always said, well, at some point in time, we realized why not turn the problem into an opportunity? In fact, what we are measuring, when we measure the catalytic activity of our sample, we measure an activity concentration. We measure chemical activity or catalytic activity per cubic meter of air. Günther Oberthörster used uh, this example also in his talk. Uh, uh, he said, Ross activity per cubic meter of air. So actually, rather than a conventional metric, I'm suggesting that we use an activity concentration to characterize um, uh, the functionality of those particles and their potential for doing harm. Now, what about biological effects? In the end, you can say, well, this kind of catalysis which we're doing here, this has nothing to do with biology. This is just a standard chemical reaction. Um, remember, I showed you this picture. Um, we can, aerosol technology is really good at designing particles, and it can make catalyst particles with a widely controlled range of primary particle sizes from three nanometers to 30 nanometers, if you wish. And you can then go and use this to compare catalytic activity on the left side and ROS production on the right side. This is a collaboration with the Finnish Institute of Occupational Hygiene. They were doing the ROS work. And what you can see, and this is all surface normalized here, it's hydrogen peroxide equivalents per meter square of surface area. What you can see is that you have a very, very pronounced 
maximum, which we cannot explain at the moment, around 10 or 12 nanometers. And this correlates very well with the catalytic activity. And besides, uh, these processes are very nicely linear uh, with regard to the amount of catalyst that of a given fixed size that you're um, putting into the system. So, um, what I would like to suggest, and this is something where aerosol technology uh, needs to work on and can contribute, I would like to suggest that we work on functionality-based particle concentration metrics in the broader context of tox toxicology and, and, uh, and uh, exposure assessment. And of course, this is a very, very challenging field. Uh, there's a lot to do. We can do it at the level of inorganic catalysis. We uh, have shown that there's a direct correlation with the in vitro ROS production. And in fact, uh, it was, you asked this question yesterday, should we have a, or, or the day before yesterday, should we have a ROS counter? Okay. I would like to change this and say, we would like to have a device which measures a functionality concentration based on the ROS production. And the device, actually, there's somebody, I cannot name this person because it's a patent application going on. There is actually already something going on to have a quasi real time way of, or let's say, minus the sampling time, of course, a quasi real time way of looking at this. And of course, there are more complex in vitro effects. And finally, there are the in vivo effects close to the endpoints. And what I'm suggesting is that aerosol technology should work on designing such processes where we deposit particles onto um, biological systems and, and inventing new assays, if you will, with which we, in more or less in real time, we could actually devise uh, responses. And this would be a way around the metrics conundrum also, because the question of whether it's mass or surface area or number, this will not go away, because I've tried to show you in the case of catalysis that neither of these metrics really works. Uh, and besides, if we could build this bridge, then we could go back and say, well, let's measure something which we can measure fast and easy, because we know that there is a correlation with the endpoint. Okay, this is, of course, a huge project. This is a 10-year uh, activity here to build this kind of bridges. But it is perhaps a faster way of assessing the effect of nanoparticles uh, in biological systems. Um, well, with that... I would like to close. I have tried to show you that um, aerosol-based material processing and characterization are, have a wonderful toolbox for structuring, for investigating structural functional relationships. And what I'm exploiting in uh, all these areas are really such things as precision and flexibility in tailoring, the measurement capabilities, and so on. Okay. But ultimately, what I really wanted to do here is I wanted to uh, inspire you, and I hope I have inspired you uh, a little bit to show that aerosol technology really is a wide open field with lots of possibilities. It's a lot more than just material science. I have a great many people to thank for here, and this is not an exhaustive list. I have been had in Karlsruhe and have a wonderful group. Uh, um, Professor Weber. Um, also contributed a lot to uh, building the capabilities. We've worked with Martin Muller. We've worked with other groups in Karlsruhe. Uh, BASF Bernd Sachwe was also somebody who uh, contributed a lot in the ideas. Um, I would like to thank all of them, and I would like to thank you for listening. Thank you, Gerhard, for this uh, nice presentation showing us the potential of aerosol technology. So we have time for a few questions, if there is uh, someone from the audience. Yes, Aisha. <laughs> Thank you, Gerhard, for this very inspiring talk and showing these very well-designed experiments. I found a question regarding your second uh, example you showed is the, the coating. This, uh, help of electrostatic effects. Yes. The main problem in that seems to me the, the space charge. You're doing these experiments with carrier particles, let's say 10 to 4 
particles per cc or something like that. Uh, you always have this phase charge effect when you have more than 10 to 6, 10 to 7 charges per cc, then you, you are in trouble. So uh, how can we come to an industrial process where we really have a higher number of <laughs> particles per cc in order to have it to, to really use it? Well, aerosol kinetics is a very complex field and uh, the, the gut feeling uh, often uh, uh, in some cases sort of misleads you. Actually, what Stephanie was able to show is that with the increasing concentration of the coating particles, right, because the number of coating particles is much higher than the number of particles which you want to coat right, by a factor of 100 or so typically. And what you see is that the kinetics increases, it gets faster as the number of coating particles goes up. And this is something funny because uh, if you look at classical collision theory, it doesn't say that. But we didn't quite model this all the way to the end, but we think it's the space charge which actually drives it. Because the space charge, dry, it's, it's an electrostatic dispersion process which goes with n squared, with the concentration squared, and it drives the aerosol onto the surface uh, provided it's well mixed. Let me add you something. I mean, you show us a lot of processes uh, taking place at the same time. Yes. So usually uh, the different rates of the processes control the final product. Yes. And that means that there is also a need of uh, modeling of the basic uh, processes of uh, chemical Indeed. reaction, surface Indeed. chemical reaction on uh, small particles and things like that. Uh, what, what do you think about uh, uh, which are the real needs uh, for controlling the process, the, this uh, aerosol processes? Well, the, 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 let's say the, the classical process like what uh, Aina Kreuz was just addressing is something that's um, fairly, it was actually modeled in collaboration with uh, a visiting scholar from uh, China, which who who's comes from this, and we did calculations, and you can pretty much predict the space charge is a little bit harder to do, but you can predict what um, the field where I really see a need, and which is absolutely not trivial to get going, is across disciplines. The, the biggest trouble you have in science is to work across, collaborate across disciplines. I mean, some groups are open, but most of the time you're not. And what we need is physical chemistry. Okay, physical chemistry and the chemical processes are the most promising ones. Um, and we can do this wonderfully on the experimental side. And of course, you can unravel certain things experimentally. But uh, the physical, physical chemistry of the surface is critical. And there, the, the kinetics, for example, we do not understand why not all the OH groups are activated at the same time. When you do the CVD process, uh, you, I mean, you can measure the OH group density. You have five or ten OH groups per square nanometer on the surface. And then you count, and then you realize that actually with time, you activate more and more of those, and we don't know why. Okay? And there's a lot of room, I think, for physical chemistry. And I think that these things are probably also interesting in the atmospheric chemistry, because the surface is really where all everything happens, and we don't know why it happens the way it does. Uh, I think there... and. There are other things as well, and this now goes more into the material science, uh, of course, because we, we, when you work on catalysis, you realize that um, wettability of the surface is a really interesting concept. I deliberately did not show you a movie. These nanodots become mobile at higher temperatures and they start to move. And one of the people in Karlsruhe has some movies, actually, where he shows that the dots begin to move. You can actually sm model a Smolovovsky process to see whether collision processes are really growth determining in these dots, Ostwald ripening versus Smolovovsky ripening. So all of that requires some understanding also of, the, of the, the type of, let's say, the electron configurations on the surface, the interaction between the different materials. And this is an inorganic problem, I realize. It's not an organic problem. I think there's what we need is collaborations with the, with the adjacent sciences because we have the tools to design the systems, but we do not have 
all the methods of answering the questions that arise. Thank you for your talk. Um, in terms of uh, product quality, um, I'm curious about the, the yield of the process and the selectivity of the, for instance, the CDS reactors. And then, uh, in terms of product quality, what the further separation process will be used concerning the reaction products and the unreacted ones? When you design such a, a continuous process, you have to, it's an integrated process. You have to plan everything from the beginning. Uh, in equilibrium processes, you can wash away your reaction products. If you use a precursor uh, for an online continuous process, it cannot contain any fluorine, for example. And a lot of, you can go to Russia and you can buy precursors for a third of the price of what they cost to make here, especially if they have precious metals in them, but they're all containing fluorine. And you can imagine what fluorine does to an aerosol process, especially if you have a DMA connected or something to monitor the process. I mean, you need a new DMA every week. You cannot do that. So you need, you need to design this thing in such a way that the contaminants of the CVD process are minimal. They're all organic groups, okay? There are rings and whatever else, and that doesn't bother you, especially if you uh, have an oxidative step somewhere in the process because then they vanish. This, this is a, something you have to take into consideration. Maybe that, I, that was a second half of your question, which uh, I don't know how to address, and it was the selectivity. I, I, what, what was the second part of it? The first part, actually, of your question. Selectivity, the not only the, the collecting. products, but also well, parallel. Okay. Ideally, you don't collect the particles uh, on a filter. Okay. This is what, of course, people do. You have a pulse jet filter and you have a powder. But a powder is a relatively low value added type of product. Wouldn't it be better, uh, and in fact, people have tried this and it, it works to some extent, wouldn't, if you want to need a catalytically active filter, why don't you take your aerosol and deposit it in the filter? Okay. Um, of course, you have a, a concentration gradient, so you have to, this is now where aerosol technology comes into the picture. I mean, how do you design a deposition process in the filter with particles so that you have a uniform or some kind of deposition, but you don't want to just collect a powder. You, you, you build a layer or you go directly into the liquid phase, um, which opens some interesting questions of wettability, by the way. And wettability is also controlled via your surface functional groups. So the transition of the particle from the aerosol to the liquid really depends on wettability. You can have a situation where the aerosol immediately agglomerates when it moves to the liquid surface, or it does not. Uh, this is something which we actually never looked at, but I have some ideas for a sort of a flow cell where you could look at the kinetics of agglomeration and transfer in the liquid phase. And we're, we're going to go back to this again uh, in terms of air-liquid interfaces also, because this is where this really becomes interesting. If you go, uh, biology, if you uh, take an aerosol and you deposit it onto cells or onto a liquid, quasi-liquid surface, do you keep individual particles or do you have an immediate agglomeration? Okay. Could we control the particle properties? So we'll end up with the, with the session, so thanks. Uh, Gerhard, for leaving, leaving us with so many open questions yeah. that will keep us busy for the coming years. So thank you, first. Thank you.